16. The subtopic that we plan to, to tackle includes pre-pregnancy planning, physiological changes in pregnancy, the red flags in pregnancy, maternal health and diet, pregnancy journey, labor and delivery, postpartum depression and other challenges, hormone complications in pregnancy. The World Health Organization, um, uh, in our country actually we have expected the achievements, the so-called SDG, SDGs 3, where by 2030 that we tend to improve our healthcare to reduce uh, maternal mortality ratio to be less than 70 in uh, at least 100,000. That is, seems like a far cry to achieve. Today, we're still well over 400 maternal mortality rate ratio to that 100,000. And there's a lot of work still left to be done to, to get where we are going. The topical issue we are presenting really outlines one of the major ways of achieving that. Because indeed, if all facets of healthcare in all parts of the country followed the proper antenatal care we tend to present today, this would definitely show a great reduction. In this regard, it is recommended that prioritizing person-centered health and well-being in considering reducing mortality and morbidity and and providing respectful care that takes into account a woman's views, optimizing service delivery at whatever point you are serving the, 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 the patients within the health systems provided. And for that reason, therefore, antenatal care is critical. Through timely, appropriate, evidence-based actions related to health promotion, disease prevention, screening, and treatment. To reduce complications for pregnancy and childbirth, reduce stillbirths and perinatal deaths, and therefore, we need to do this through integrated care delivery throughout pregnancy. I need to point at this point that uh, this is not only from one side. The patient who is our client must participate by showing willingness to participate in all the guidelines given, because if they don't, it is it definitely will not be able to achieve. This, as you are aware, in our setup is very much affected by cultural settings. There are people who still today believe that uh, traditional bath attendance or um, bathing through home settings is the place to be. And clearly you can see the journey we have to go, which includes educating our people. There's of course the issue regarding financial ability to be able to uh, get to where the health facilities are provided. What are, what, are, what about the women you're talking about? What are their views uh, about uh, this issue? We are being told that women want positive pregnancy experience from antenatal care, from antenatal care, to achieve a healthy pregnancy for mother and baby, including preventing or treating risks, illness, and death. To achieve physical, social, cultural normality during pregnancy, effective transition to positive labor and birth, positive motherhood, including maternal self-esteem, is vital uh, competence and autonomy. So, where do we start? You are thinking about getting pregnant, or you already know 
to your pregnancy. You may have, you have had babies before, or baby or babies before. You and your partner should embrace the situation and the changes that will be required. This is not an easy journey. There will be difficult areas like emotions involving this journey, mixed feelings about whether you should have this baby, is it the right time? Is it the right partner? One may feel happy, you may be anxious, and happy about being pregnant at this time. Maybe you planned next year, two years to come, and it has come. In, therefore, uh, we are not also forgetting the situation we call the oops scenario. All the same, we must deal with it. Choice of medical facility or a choice of a good clinic you are aware of, hospital, or a good doctor you have been introduced to or you know or who has been taking care of you, it is your choice. It must be a well-informed choice so that you don't go into the wrong hands. There is the aspect of financing the health care. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are very much conscious of this need. Uh, our own colleagues are out in the streets campaigning for salaries and many other health facilities which are not adequately equipped. So it, financing the process is a journey. And we just pray that uh, our economy improves to the level that we can now feel it and enjoy. Pre-pregnancy planning, the concerns which are not anticipated. There is a question of who done it. Uh, there's a question of, it was not my responsibility for you to take care. And here we are, we have a baby coming. Whichever the case, and whether we are prepared or not, we must still deal with the situation. It, individuals who will be of great assistance to you in this journey, we mentioned a few. You, it is your choice to approach any of the seven included here as a first contact at least to seek assurance and confidence. There's a midwife, a very close family friend, there is obstetrician, we've been visiting for other needs, a dietitian who will guide you to the choice of foods or diet that you should start taking. There is the physiotherapist who will help you with your pains, backache and knees and what. And uh, if you have issues of quarrel with your spouse, you are deliberated to approach a relationship expert, at least to help you sort out your personal issues. Then, of course, uh, the church, we can't forget the church. I mean, that is one we all fall back to church to seek solace and comfort. The ministers should be able to guide us out of these difficult situations. We should not forget our parents, of course, who know us very well. And if you feel your mom is the best person to come be confidentially tell your hassles and your worries, that is, of course, uh, a good idea. We are moving on quickly to discuss uh, the difficulty journey of having this baby. And what are the changes that we are going to encounter, we are going to uh, experience in the journey. We have a guest in our tummy who has demands. So the metabolic rate actually goes up to be able to provide for this baby. So your diet must be optimal, among other things. We shall talk about that later. But with that, the respiratory rate goes up to enhance uh, oxygen saturation throughout the body and particular to the baby. The cardiovascular mm -hmm. system uh, is enhanced first by increased body volume of water, fluid circulating the body, 
to be able to take food and uh, needs to the baby and to take away the uh, waste uh, from our body. And other body parts are growing in preparation for this baby, the breasts develop, and many other things. The GI system, we experience changes even as early as the first trimester because there's bloated tummy. And with this in mind, uh, weight gain is all experienced. And towards the end of the pregnancy, this would be about 10, 12 kg uh, or thereabouts. Changes in pregnancy, systemic specific areas. I've just mentioned a few. For example, the heart rate, which is increased. Cardiac output, I've talked about increased volume of fluid in the body. Changes in the pulmonary system, you tend to breathe a bit faster. Improved musculoskeletal area and uh, the renal function in particular. What are the red flags in pregnancy? Our patients will most likely be the one to experience and therefore come to your office or present to the clinic of their choice to sort solids or to be treated. And the, basic, the most likely thing they talk about is that they have a headache, they have a vaginal discharge, or they experience abdominal pain, uh, swelling of the face, or they may have fever. And therefore, obviously, they have to talk to their health provider for assistance. This particular slide is borrowed from one of, of our programs in healthcare in the country, as indicated there. Red flags in pregnancy, that is high risk pregnancy. Uh, presence of concurrent diseases uh, in this particular patient who is pregnant, obviously some of, almost of those will affect the outcome of the, of the process. The age factor, Baby, uh, mothers less than 20 years have specific issues that needs attention. We are talking about the adolescence and the teenage pregnancy. We know what that means to the society, to the parents, to everybody, and to themselves. Babies above 35 years. I must say at this point in my practice, we are seeing more and more mothers coming in the age of 40 uh, because time went by when we were pursuing uh, pursuance of excellence in the academia, and looking for better paying jobs, then finally babies took a second position in life. This is with, not without challenge. We categorize you as a risk pregnancy uh, patient. Previous serious section scan could be one, could be two. Sometimes they come to our office with four or five serious scars and they're looking for a baby. Gender-based violence, which is quite common, placental abnormalities, multiple gestation, and all those sort. If you have an IVF pregnancy, obviously we categorize you as a special patient, uh, considering all the emotions and investment you are put into that exercise. Other diseases um, that may happen with it is we are talking about HIV, mental disorders. Uh, the robotic episodes and all that about presentation and stabilize all those things. Maternal health and diet, a very important aspect to ensure that our journey is smooth to a life where we want to be. There are several choices we can vary on a day to day basis. You must have regular meals morning, evening, and evening, and you can snack in between as you wish. We got nuts, which provide vitamins and energy. We got daily products, also vitamins, proteins, eggs, all that provided. And of course, the greens should be looked at, uh, vegetables, broccoli, folic acid, essential element that you should take 
especially in early stages of pregnancy, and the fruits. Now, we are advised to take at least five of the 10 food groups each day, and each, eat a variety of foods within each food group, so at least you don't miss out. Uh, take one extra meal per day. And that's what I meant by saying you can do in between meals, you can do snacking. Improve your diet further by taking supplements provided by the health provider, into particularly to get uh, a good uh, dosage of folic acid, and uh, that must be taken. In fact, we recommend that to be taken a month before conception, if you are in a position to plan for it. And even if you don't still take it, then many, very many to realize that you're pregnant. And this helps to prevent a special congenital illnesses involving the brain and the spinal cord. Calcium and all that should be taken. Then, and this we highlight because it's very critical, avoid processed foods. This includes Coca-Cola. All those things that are fizzling on the, from the shelf, they are not good for pregnancy. They are going to affect our baby. And with that, of course, goes with other fizzling drinks. Tasca, na katharika, wachana na We are pregnant, and you want, we, are, we suspect you are pregnant, we want to confirm pregnancy, and uh, we, we can do our own uh, testing at home. You just go to the chemist, buy a pregnancy kit, testing kit. You can do that at home, in your own comfort, testing urine, and you see up to the age of 7% uh, to be positive anywhere between six to seven weeks after missing your last period. Uh, you can quickly follow that through with your health provider for an ultrasound to confirm pregnancy or pregnancy gestations. Uh, then uh, we are presenting also the clinical presentation. The blood test. Uh, six to eight days after ovulation, you should be able to be positive as, at the same time. In this journey of providing antenatal care, I have put in one of uh, the journey that we take in our clinic. And uh, uh, so the, 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 the page is loaded with things. You may not be able to pick anything from that. But uh, in summary, we are talking about um, the milestones that you go through. The first contact with the doctor is recommended to be around seven weeks, which is important to confirm where the pregnancy is implanted. It is important to confirm whether we have multiple gestation. Seven weeks is the best time. And with seven weeks, they do the what you call the first scan. Mm which is uh, to go show uh, the dates, to confirm the dates of the pregnancy, and also to do the possibilities of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, the visits and uh, we, we hope to achieve should be no less than eight visits throughout the whole pregnancy. The first contact also, we will want to do tests, what we call the basic profile, to list to kind of a medical checkup of yourself, ruling out STDs, ruling out uh, issues to do with the diabetes, ruling out whether you are anemia, anemic or not, and also checking to see whether we are suffering from blood pressure, which you did to know, and to confirm your BMI, or rather to check your weight and calculate your so uh, metabolic index so that you can be advised on your diet properly. Uh, there are special tests that must be done during this journey. For the ladies who are above 35, the literature and research will indicate that they are at higher risk of getting uh, congenital illnesses for the, the when babies with congenital illnesses, particularly Down's syndrome. I must say at this stage, 
this is fairly and common, it's not so common in our setup. We don't see many institutions of this kind, wherever uh, we are held or where we live in, the villages you come from, the estates you come from. I guess, I don't know whether it has to do with where we live, but that's the way it is. So screening for Down syndrome is good at this point in time. At around 11, 14 weeks, you go through an ultrasound assessment and the readings, uh, the radiologist will advise whether we have a baby who is likely to be a Down syndrome baby or not. And this will lead to further tests, chromosome genetic uh, studies to confirm the process. In this regard, I must want to say that this is not conclusive completely, that there's always um, negative uh, findings that uh, may not be noticed and eventually we find a problem and vice versa. False positives also could occur such that mm -hmm. you may have to decide to keep up the pregnancy or you terminate at whatever time as you discuss with your doctors. We screen you for diabetes as well, which is done around 24, 28 weeks of pregnancy by doing oral glucose tolerance tests. So we feed you with sugar in the morning when you're fasting and we find we do tests for sugar to find out whether your body is able to deal with that load of sugar within a specified time. If we find that you are at risk, we take the necessary measures to manage that process. You have heard about Elisa's incompatibility. Mothers who have blood group which is Elisa's negative, and they marry a husband with Elisa's positive, who gives a baby who is Elisa's positive. There's a danger there. And the danger here is that we may get Elisa's isoimmunization from their baby, and that endangers the babies that are following at a later uh, next uh, pregnancy and so forth. So we must screen the process such that if we find that situation is the case, there is a way we manage it so that you don't get sensitized and uh, you therefore future pregnancies will be safe. Uh, we talk about tetanus toxoid, that one uh, we all know. Uh, and the very much we now we have technology to help us see the babies as they grow. One of them is the ultrasound. Uh, and the very minimum, really, we should ultrasound imaging that you should have is three. If you're in a position to get that, you're way, way ahead. The first uh, trimester, that is up to about 13 weeks, is a good time to test to know uh, where whether baby is doing well. I mentioned that earlier. The second trimester, 18, uh, 20, uh, 20, around 18 to 22 weeks, we call it an anomaly scan. And this, if you refer to earlier discussion about uh, Down syndrome, about congenital illnesses, is a good place to pick it up. And then, of course, you plan for that baby as we move on. And for those keen on learning the gender of the baby, this is a very good time to, to have to see it. The last scan you want to do is the one you, uh, you do allowed uh, that uh, six, that eight weeks, also to assess the weight of the baby, to assess the presentation, and to plan delivery there. Between that uh, two, that four weeks is a good time to think about which hospital you intend to visit. And this is informed by various things, as we come to discuss later, financing, whether you have a medical insurance for that purpose. Um, and you discuss this with the doctor who will also advise you the best place to be, depending on what are the findings you may be having. If you have multiple gestation and you want to go to a certain hospital, the doctor will definitely tell you there is a risk there. You want to go in a place where facilities are available to take care of these small babies who are likely to come early, and therefore you don't end up losing your twins, you don't end up losing your triplets. Uh, quickly forward the post natal, but that will come later in our discussion. Now, 
Let's talk about uh, the, uh, the thesis of, of the journey that we intend to take, that the, the, what we call the first trimester. What are the physiological, or should I say, the experiences that you are likely to encounter during the first to one week to 13 weeks? The morning sickness, we, a good number of us have experienced and uh, there is also start experiencing urgency and frequency of urination. Uh, the doctors and midwives would explain to you why that happens, not only possibilities of infection, but simply because there is space occupation of a baby in the pelvis fighting for space with the bladder. Mood swings, food aversions, cravings, bloating, and that's easily explained. There are certain risks in this stage of pregnancy that we may actually lose the baby in a cross congenital illnesses, which we, we are yet to appreciate fully. We call it blighted ovum, uh, simply saying that the seed we have planted has failed to germinate and to grow for various reasons. There are other conditions we call cervical incompetence. For those mothers, we, we tend to lose babies during this time. We lose one, two, three, and then we give you a diagnosis of recurrence of uh, miscarriages. Then we need to look into that also, and there are ways of managing that by providing a stitch, we call it sacrage or McDonald's stitch. Dating and viability of pregnancy must be done with an ultrasound, and then, of course, the issue of the current strategies we talked about. Second trimester. This is the stage from 14 to 28 weeks. Uh, we call it a honeymoon experience. Indeed it is because all those things you experienced earlier, they tend to subside. The issues of morning sickness in Aisha, and you start feeling good about yourself. You start looking at yourself, feeling good that you have got a baby growing up quickly. 18 weeks and onwards, you may start feeling the movement. Your appetite improves, the eating habits improve. And now we could say the whole world starts acknowledging your gift, uh, that you're going to have a baby, and everybody is celebrating. At this point, the need to do certain tests, again, to ensure a good outcome. Uh, you had a PET scan, as we mentioned earlier, in the second trimester. We call it a normal scan uh, to rule out diabetes screening. We mentioned that earlier. And to rule out Lisa's negative situation. And don't forget intimacy in marriage. You are married to people, so uh, there are certain moments should be taken, issues to be taken care of. Third trimester. This is the period between 29 and 40 weeks. Uh, we experience rapid weight gain. Uh, there's a tendency to really want to eat. The baby is demanding as it is growing. And um, we also tend to get tired, uh, reduced effort and tolerance, climbing stairs. You sometimes have to stop and rest for a while. And particularly if you are not taking enough uh, hematinics or your blood levels is low and your body is fighting to get oxygen and the baby is fighting for the same oxygen. So that gap is shown by your inability to tolerate the pregnancy and therefore you tend to pant and get tired easily. Reflux is um, the acidity flowing from the stomach up the swallowing tube, especially when you lie flat, and there's, there are ways of sorting that one out. Either you put pillows uh, behind your back and uh, stay uh, up a little bit, uncomfortable way of sleeping, but if it demands, so be it. At this point, you start feeling the fetal movements and so forth. We have reduced sleep and all that. Remember uh, the final ultrasound, which is critical. 
to investigate how the baby is doing, the fetal weight assessment, you know, confirm gestation, to confirm presentation. And as such, we'll be able to affirm the model delivery that we plan to undertake. Bottom there, a very important area of concern is have we decided which hospital to deliver this baby? Again, you discuss this with your midwife, you discuss this with your uh, provider, that's the obstetrician gynecologist, and you'll be able to advise you. I mentioned earlier, if you have, uh, say, multiple pregnancy, twins or triplets, you obviously must be in a high level hospital situation. The risk of delivering these babies earlier, as I mentioned, is there. So you want to be in a hospital where facilities are there to take care of small babies uh, before their time. Now move very quickly. WHO recommendations for intrapartum care uh, to achieve this positive child birth experience. This is uh, the, the chat put there is to touch on various aspects of to achieve this, like with these mothers who need emotional support from their spouse, from their family members, colleagues at work. Uh, this need to be uh, treated with respect and in particular with the time they get into labor. Uh, the people managing their, their process must talk to them with the respect and uh, give effective communication and all that. Mobility, labor, and bad position choice need to be protected. Stairs and things like that should be avoided. Uh, certain modes of transport are not conducive for mothers at this stage. I'll leave that one. We move on now to intrapartum stage. This is the time that uh, this is, we have reached term and uh, we are moving quickly to uh, now to get into deliver. What are the indicators for, uh, for labor? This varies actually from one individual to another, but mostly mothers who say they are having low abdominal pain, cramping in nature, others who say they're having lower back pain, and uh, it may present in that form. Or you may just suddenly see water breaking. The baby sack at this point in time could just break even before you experience low abdominal pain, uh, lower back pains. And these are the signs to tell you that we have actually arrived on our journey. And this uh, therefore, devices or twists informs you that you need to be proceeding to the hospital of your choice where we already booked. They are expecting you. You take your bag and your papers, which you are given by your doctor after booking this process, and proceed to maternity. There is those who feel it is too early to go to labor at that point in time especially mothers who have had one, two babies before. And they are better advised that that's not a good idea because in between complications will occur before you arrive to where you're supposed to be to receive care. So the very minute or the very time that you realize you're in labor, don't waste any time. Quickly take your bag and your papers and proceed to the health facility of your choice. Now, a good number of us may not really achieve uh, spontaneous labor as it were. And you go past 40 weeks, which is considered the time when babies should be delivered. We allow uh, what you call the benefit, we give you the benefit of doubt, we give you one week in some centers, and some centers allow 10 days after the due date give the benefit of that to see whether you go to spontaneous labor, which is really desired. But if you fail in all this, then, uh, then we, we, we request that uh, you attend 
uh, to the clinic you are uh, going, and the doctor will know how to help you. The doctor will know how to uh, to, to to facilitate the process of induction so that you get into proper labor. Now, a comment about induction versus argumentation of labor. There's a difference in the sense that induction, you are not in labor. Argumentation of labor is that you have started labor, but it is not progressing at the speed it is going as supposed to, 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 to go. So we add medication to improve contractions or to improve the process. Mode of delivery, vagina of a Sicilian, that choice is not your choice. It's advised by the health provider. But antenatal clinic process, which I explained earlier, it is that is the time actually their decision is made. The process will advise or to at least inform us when what is the best method for you. If we feel this baby is too big to for you to manage uh, what we call the large babies. Uh, for you to manage the vaginal process, obviously, will advise you and will tell you the difficulties ahead, and therefore elective Sicilian is necessary. If you have a previous car or two previous cars, don't even think about vaginal delivery. And this is an area where we fail out, uh, where mothers are advised by the local experts that your, your mother made it vaginally, your auntie made it vaginally. You should also do it. You should try this one. That one they failed. It will give you a scar for nothing. Try vaginal delivery at home. Those are the risks that uh, we should avoid and uh, take the advice given by the health provider. The same clinic we attended through the antenatal clinic is where we pick indicators for successful vaginal uh, delivery and should be advised accordingly. Take note that we could also have labor before that seven weeks. We call that preterm labor and the management process almost the same, but uh, with certain portions here and there. Post delivery, we have a baby now, a palliative post delivery. And um, what are the issues that you want to take care of? Uh, emptying the bladder, movement, keep moving. Uh, so that uh, we don't get problems or robotic episodes. Uh, the midwives and uh, the, the nursing fraternity will advise you on latching and establishing to how to establish lactation. Uh, mothers who have been there before, they don't need to be told, they already know what to do. If you had a serious section, you sh your wood should be uh, taken care of. And if you're in pain, you're given dower to relieve pain. Um, and again, uh, it is highlighted there that we are, you are encouraged to ambulate all the time. The risk of robotic episodes is, uh, is very high, and especially in pregnancy states. Those that are the physiological changes that take care that had happened in our body. And to avoid those risks of getting deep vein arthrosis, uh, keep walking and uh, avoid uh, that situation. It is also advised uh, that uh, when you go home after uh, after being discharged, you are still ailing, you're still suffering, you're still in pain from Sicilia, you're still suffering from stitching from down there. It is not the best time to encourage visitors to come and say hello to the baby. Avoid visitors and the husband can help you with that or other relatives can help you with that. This is for your time to recover, to sleep and get well. Common complications in pregnancy include the, the worst of them or postpartum, uh, I will go to see postpartum hemorrhage, it will come later, but let me talk about postpartum blues uh, the mood swings are obvious, but uh, the risk of postpartum blues or depression is uh, is a very common phenomenon. And in particular, uh, to those who, who had difficult pregnancies, 
uh, the couple that had matrimonial issues, uh, family matters that are weighing you down, um, and especially if the pregnancy came at a time you did not want, and I have seen people getting depressed because they got the sex they didn't plan to have, the sex of the baby that is. So all this is an issue for a matter of concern and the health provider should be able to help you out. They, we also do have fatherhood challenges, almost similar and for the same reasons. Hypertension, pregnancy losses, bleeding, malaria, anemia, diabetes, uh, the health provider will help you with that. Postpartum blues, depression, and fatherhood challenges explained there. Uh, we move on to postpartum depression and other uh, cases quickly. I think we are short of time, and uh, I don't even need to stress that issue of fatherhood. So thank you very much for those who are listening. And my lovely girls are uh, here with me, support uh, the process. And that below there is uh, uh, and that's it. Wow, 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 that is great, Dr. Ali. Thank you so very much for such an enlightening presentation. Um, I can see we have so many questions in our chat book, but I want to I want to to to, to give you a surprise moment before we go to the chat box to the chat box. So give me a minute, I project something. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Uh, as we prepare to move on to the next um, slide, unfortunately, we apologize for that hitch. Dr. Tari, maybe you can just pick one or two questions. Uh, how does substance abuse affect pregnancy? You mentioned we should not take beer. And uh, one of our audience is asking, uh, they've learned that whiskey, not whiskey, Guinness, is high in calcium. How true is that? Not aware. Yeah. I should end up and check what Guinness contains, but uh, alcohol is known to affect uh, pregnancy outcome. Uh, chronic abusers of alcohol, uh, even if it's a, a whiskey a day or a bottle of beer a day, or, uh, it, they start to suffer consequences. And the baby outcome is poor. For one, we they get uh, low birth weight babies. If you plan to, baby and baby should have achieved a good weight of 2.8 and above, 3.5. We tend to get low birth weight babies who are very prone to uh, the challenges of the past few days of life. Now, the, it also tends to affect the brain development of the baby. So this is a baby who have difficulties in school because the mother abused alcohol. We don't want that to happen. So really avoid alcohol. And this we know, it has nothing to do 
with just a bottle because I've had uh, requests from mothers that can we take a, a glass of wine? It is my birthday today. This, we tell the patients, it is not dose dependent. It's not that you took just a glass of wine. It is the amount of alcohol you take, uh, whether it's a glass or a bottle, whether you take it daily, if the effect in most the patients is always the same. So if you want to cheer, uh, but it will cheer us with anybody, take a glass of milk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. We've all had uh, milk is not harmful. What about pineapples? How safe are pineapples in pregnancy? Are there any side effects? I didn't know there's any. Okay. Some things they have. I think it's a good fruit. It's got a lot of sugar, yes. Uh, but how many pineapples can you take in a day? So, I mean, enjoy the fruit. It's enjoy it. It's a good. In fact, it's a very good lavage to push things down. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Um, one of my audience is asking, uh, uh how? What is, I mean, is it okay to rely on a scan of around 35 weeks to determine delivery dates as opposed to the first scan of less than 10 weeks? <laughs> Interesting question. Well, uh, there are reasons where scans are done during the first trimester, the first uh, week, seven week, up to 10 weeks. We said, uh, you, uh, you want to, they, they'll give you the estimated uh, gestation date, uh, expected date of delivery. And uh, as you remember in our presentation, we said you want to do a scan during the second trimester, which is an anomaly scan to tell you, because there you are able to assess the body parts much more clearly and uh, with the defined uh, instruments of ultrasound. We know the best time in all those three plus, uh, gestational stages, that is the second trimester is the best time to inform the expected date of delivery. And this is in a situation where mothers are not sure of their last monthly period. Because the very first contact you meet to the doctor, you want to know your first day of the last menstruation. And that is the, one of the best ways of assessing uh, the date of uh, your baby and when the expected date delivery will be. Failure to that, if you are not sure of those dates, then the best position is best done during the second trimester. But 35 weeks, it is good to do an ultrasound, yes, but for other reasons. We assess the weight of the baby. We assess other things, presentation, uh, the, the, the what we call the physical profile. Now, this, it will also suggest the possible date of uh, delivery, but the variance uh, from the mid trimester may be quite large. So we tend to, to stick to the second trimester. That is if you have been following antenatal clinic with the uh, Thank you, Dr. Tari. Uh, nowadays, there are so many cases of increased fetal anom anomalies and other parents say they start, they started taking folic acid, I mean, uh, folic acid tabs <laughs> for folic. Immediately they got expectant. Can one start taking folic before they conceive. True, yes, that is what is advised. Obviously, we don't know when conception will take place, but if you are in the in a marriage institution and you are already focused to getting a baby, it doesn't matter when it will happen, maybe next week, next month, maybe six months down the road, it is good to take folic acid in advance. That will help the outcome. And folic acid, just for confirmation, is to help prevent what you call the brain and the spinal cord defects. We call it in our terms, neurotube defects. These are babies who come out with big head, uh, hydrocephalus, and swellings along the spinal cord, affecting the spinal cord area. So if you want to avoid that, let's take folic acid. What are the chances that if you had a first incident, there will be a recurrence of getting the anomality again? Well, I think this is specific to the baby. I mean, you every baby you must prepare for it. 
in the, in the same way that we have explained. So you are saying, what are the possibilities that you got an abnormality, the first baby to happen with the second baby? Yes. Uh, and I, I, I'm saying that every baby is treated as, as an individual. It, oh yes, of course, the genetics from the parents is still the same, but every baby and every pregnancy is treated differently from the first one. And mothers, in fact, to tell me, this baby is not like the first one. This one is troublesome. The other one was very peaceful. Pregnancies are not always the same. And if the outcome of the pregnancies is very different from the first one. So any measure that you are advised to take to prevent the risk for that baby, you must take. Thank you so much, Dr. I have so many questions for you, but just before I continue, APA is the home of happiness, and us at APA in support with our new moms or existing moms or those who are coming again and again and again, we are humbled uh, to have started a club that we will be getting introduced to. It's not a, an alcohol club. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a mom's club. Eh? So I would like to hand over to Jemima. I'll give you five minutes before I continue with the questions uh, for Dr. Ngayu. I can see a lot of questions, and I'm happy that our moms would love to understand what happens. Even for the young ladies who are planning to do the same, please stay put as we have uh, our own Jemima. Jemima is the head of uh, medical um, care team and also medical services that we give at APA. Karibu sana, Jemima. Maybe you can tell us what you have in store for us. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Zainab and uh, Dr. Ari. Um, uh, Dr. Ari talked about having support groups um, during your pregnancy journey. And here at AP Insurance, we have not been left behind. We have a beautiful package and a special gift for all our mothers, mothers-to-be, and the mothers who've already uh, given birth to their bouncing babies. And so um, we, we will continue with the questions, but I would like to take this moment, and I have the pleasure to introduce to you a very meticulously thought out program which is designed to work closely with our mothers pre-pregnancy and post-pregnancy. Uh, the support system is a critical um, component during the journey of pregnancy, navigating the challenges, the changes, and therefore AP Insurance has come up with a, with a club um, that is going to help us walk through that journey with us. This is a journey, this is a club that you can introduce to your sisters, your, your aunties, your friends, um, APA members. It's for both APA and non-APA non because we affect the society and not just the, the, the APA membership. It is therefore uh, my pleasure to introduce to you the APA Insurance Moms Club. Um, this APA Insurance Moms Club is an adventurous and a thrilling uh, journey to motherhood. What we have done for you is that we will bring you into a community of mothers who are going to work together with you and share their experiences and their and their and their and, and their challenges and also just have experts coming in to talk to us about this journey. Today it is not a better day to introduce this club to you. Dr. Ngayu has just taken us through the pregnancy journey. And therefore, this is just the ideal time for us to introduce this mom's club to you. And there will be several benefits to you when you join the club. It is managed on online uh, platforms through a WhatsApp group that we have already um, come up with. And the benefits that you're seeing lined up there will be shared to you through the, on the, 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 the online uh, platforms. So one of the things that I uh, that that we are going to be doing, we will be having expert webinars. This is just one we have had today, so just the the beginning. So there will be several coming up every once a month for you to learn and to be empowered about the the journey of pregnancy. We are also going to be allowing moms to talk to to us about their businesses, and we bring the moms into a spotlight. Moms who are starting businesses or would want to learn about how to start businesses. So we have a, a mompreneur spotlight, a day that we'll be setting aside for that. 
we have beautiful discounts that we've already negotiated for our mothers um, and, uh, and the partners. These are moms and ch children products. Um, so at, uh, a, a day in the, in, in the week, we'll be bringing in our suppliers who will be talking to us about the discounted products that they have in store for us. We also have, want our moms to take care of themselves. So we want our moms to uh, ha have a day for self-care, just uh, mindfully thinking about yourself and taking care of yourself because mothers are known to take care of everyone else apart from themselves. So we have a day, a themed wellness uh, Wednesday, which is a special day for our mothers. And then we also have the experts who will be having specialists. Uh, today we've had a gynecologist, uh, we'll also be having nutritionists. We'll, ha we'll be having um, a psychologist coming in to answer all our questions. So it is important that you continue working this journey in this well thought uh, program. And then guess what? After you have delivered your bouncing baby, we will come to you and give you a special gift just to tell to 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 appreciate that you have managed to carry the baby through the journey and you have been able to bring a life into this world. So we are going to have a special gift back for you and for your child. And this is just specially for our mothers. So uh, this and more uh, will be one of, will be some of the benefits that you will enjoy when you join the club. Now, how do we enroll? We have the number that is projected on your screens I have said that it's an online platform, so we are going to use a WhatsApp group, and the number is 0740-429-738. Well, the number is going to be put in the chat, so all you need to do is to send the word month club to the number, and we will enroll you into the program. We've already um, done a pilot enrollment, so we, we, we want to welcome you all especially into the program. Please feel free to come on board with us and we walk the journey. I'll play to you a video just uh, for a few minutes and for you to exactly see what it is we are talking about. Thank you so much. Jim. There is the good news for our moms, um, so that we are able to, for the interest of time, I will not continue, but please let's engage on the WhatsApp group, Karibuni Sana, to the APA Moms Club, the home of happiness. And I also want to mention that it is free. We have taken care of all the costs that are associated with the Moms Club. So feel free to join and enjoy the benefits. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jemaima. I have Mr. Mashari Amongi asking, now that you invited fathers to join this talk, are we invited to join the Moms Club or do we call it the Father's or Daddy's Club? I don't know what you have in mind, Jemaima. So we work together with our fathers. So please, fathers, feel free because we want to support when we are carrying these pregnancies. So it is, we are also inviting our daddies to join the club so that when you learn, you know how to take care of your wife. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jemima. Today we are humbled to have three doctors in the room. 
And the next question, I would like to throw it to Dr. Mudoni. I, uh, this question is, um, what causes hyper, hyper, hyper salvation, hyper what? It's not so clear what she needs, but I think she's asking hyper salvation in pregnancy. I think she's missed something, yeah? Sometimes for the whole team and there is a remedy. All right. For the whole team. Yeah, I think she means hypersalivation. Thank mm -hmm. you for the question. It just means that the women who are pregnant, they have the urge to sit all the time. It's not that they make excessive saliva. It's just that, um, especially when they're very nauseated in the first trimesters, mm -hmm. they are unable to swallow saliva as well as they normally would. And a couple of them have to keep spitting it out because it becomes excessive in the mouth. Um, it's basically hormonal, it's the hormonal changes in pregnancy in the mouth where you have altered taste. That's the main problem. Does it have a solution? Well, maybe not, but um, sometimes you recommend taking something with a strong taste, like um, heavy mint taste or a ginger taste that very sour or minty, it may help. If it doesn't help, um, they could still spit, but maybe in a hygienic fashion, maybe carry some place you could spit or into a towel so you don't keep spitting on the ground because of hygiene reasons. Does it resolve? Yes, for most people it will resolve after the first three, four months of pregnancy. For a few women, it may extend till term. But the best thing is that pregnancy does not last forever. So if you have it and you're feeling bothered about it, feel encouraged, it will end as soon as your pregnancy ends. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Jemima. I am not expecting, but I would like to join the Moms Club. Yes, um, this is a, a journey for pre-expectant mothers, expectant mothers and post-delivery. Come join us. We will, you will learn and get empowered even for the days to come. Thank you so much. Jemima, this goes to Dr. Nyawira. Is it safe to take a boda boda in a bumpy road? Any effects when I'm expectant? <laughs> uh, I, I wonder if uh, it's that question. Yeah, I to... <laughs> Thanks for the questions and thank you for the opportunity to um, just meet with your your. your um, your clients, if I can say, or your mothers, let me say that. Um, I think the question um, make, you know, mobility, mobility in pregnancy, um, bumpy road, ideally it shouldn't, but the biggest concern I think from, from where we I sit or where we start, sit is, um, maybe early pregnancies and uh, and and uh, third trimester pregnancies. So the issue with the bumpy roads is that you have all these um, forces that are coming back at you. You know, you, you hit a bump and the force that you hit the bump with is transmitted back. You know, we, you know, from back those days in high school, we learned that Newton's law or something that every force is a, if every force you apply, there's a counter force. So those pressures, you know, you, you see, those counter forces are transmitted back through the tire up, up and, and are felt through the mother. So obviously if you're in a, a, a vehicle, that force, counter force is transmitted across the vehicle, across four tires. Um, if you're in a, a, a good car, you know, or just let me say if you're in a vehicle, that counter force is transmitted evenly, less of it will come to you. If you're in a border border, those are only two wheels, you get that counter force all the way through. So early pregnancies, time of implantation, very critical. We wouldn't want to disrupt placentation. It's like a seed, seed bed. If you imagine a seed bed, the seedlings are put kind of candle candle. You know, you, yeah. you're, you're incubating this nice cat seedling, the, the soil is soft. The seedling needs to germinate and establish itself. Then finally, you transfer it to to the to the to the shamba. You know the main ground. 
So the same thing with our pregnancy, bumps, no, we don't want, we don't like. I would avoid border borders, especially first trimester, third trimester, but just generally all through, it, and not even just for the pregnancy sake, even for health sake, you know, there's increased risk of motor, you know, uh, border, border accidents. So you expose yourself unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Jemima. I am trying to conceive. Just a minute, Atari, I'll come back to you. I am trying to conceive. Can I join the Moms Club? Jemima, over to you. Yes, yes. This club is not discriminatory. It is for all mothers. We will talk to you about how to conceive and also attach you and navigate you to doctors who can help you in case you're having difficulties in conceiving or even if you're having a difficult pregnancy or if you have had a bad obstetric history, please join. We have lined up experts whom we can attach to you and can advise you. Thank you so much, Jemima. Over to you, Dr. Ngayu. You wanted to add on something to what Dr. Nyawera had said? Oh, I, I don't know whether she mentioned this. My fear on the bumpy road is uh, the risk to the unborn child where the mother has issues. I'm talking about uh, previous cars in advanced labor in a bumpy road to have a very bad uh, outcome. I'm talking about multiple gestation advanced labor, uh, a rupture of membranes, those kind of things I could encounter. But the nature of our roads is the way it is. We can't avoid it. We can't blame these mothers for picking a hook book. It is the only means she has to, to advance to the market. It is the only means she has to go to the same health facility we are talking about. It, I would rather take the tuk tuk than walk. So uh, the question here is whether the tuk tuk rider can slow down a bit to make it comfortable for the mother. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngayu, and uh, to you, Jemima, thank you for accommodating the boy child. Father. <laughs> Without us, there's no normal pregnancy. Yes. I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, hi, uh, this goes to Dr. Ngayu. I was using Femi, Femi plan before. Now I've been trying to get pregnant and no success at all. Would you kindly advise what should I do? <laughs> What's that? Okay, yeah. Let me for, to start off, say using Femi plan does not, or we don't know that it will affect fertility. The minute you stop using the family plan or what you call combined uh, hormonal contraception, it uh, ceases at that point. The effects of the hormone ceases at that point and your body adjusts back to normal. So it is, does not affect or influence the possibilities of conception. So in that regard, therefore, we need to appreciate other things that may affect fertility. What about the age? What about uh, other illnesses that may, may cause uh, the mother not to have on time? So maybe the best person to decide on that would be the clinical or the health provider. She should uh, head to a gynecologist, to a obstetrician, to help with that decision. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tari. How safe is it to have a vaginal delivery when you have had a critical surgery um, in two years, I mean, years before. Critical surgery, what kind of surgery? I'm not so sure what she means by critical surgery. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know if it's a CS, I don't know if it's a major gynecological surgery. Maybe we just look at the, the surgery. Maybe we assume it's gynecological uh, surgery. Uh, <laughs> there's no straight answer to that, okay. Let's assume the surgery that you had was gynecological, removing fibroids, for example. Uh, that definitely, uh, the choice would be a cesarean. Why? Because removing fibroid leaves cars on the same uterus, uh, and it is treated like you have had a cesarean uh, before. So that I would uh, not recommend that uh, you go through vaginal delivery. If it is surgery, major surgery involving other parts or body organs, maybe the gut or probably surgery or the pubic 
uh, fixing the arm, it's a major surgery, or fixing any other part of the body, the obstetrician can give you the choice of bathing through the normal process instead of going through cesarean. And we should not also forget that uh, the same surgery uh, that you had can be complicated by taking you back to theater for a cesarean. So it is, it's a thin area, only the health provider who knows you and who knows the nature of surgery you had should advise what method of delivery you should take. Thank you so much. Uh, this one goes to Dr. Modoni. Uh, which trimester should anti-D be administered? Um, thank you for the question. So, first of all, anti-D is an injection given to women who are resus negative. Resus is when you have your blood repeated at any positive or negative. That positive or negative aspect is the resus aspect. So it's given to women who are resus negative to prevent their babies from their mother's proteins attacking them, something we call isoimmunization. So it's usually given around 28 weeks. That's a bit tail end, mm, second. second trimester. Mm. And ideally, yeah. again, either just before they have the going to labor or after delivery. So it's given at two points in the pregnancy. Thank you, thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Nyawera. Can diabetes cause chromosomal anomalies such as uh, hydrocephalus? Let, let, me, let me get a, a group concession, consensus on that one. Um, but yes, I can assist. Mm -hmm. um, diabetes does not cause chromosomal abnormalities. However, it is associated with certain types of birth defects. And the pathway through which that occurs is very high sugar levels. So the type of birth defects you can get include of the lower spine, something we call sacroagenesis. Mm -hmm. You can also get problems with the heart especially where the big blood vessels that take blood to the heart or away from the heart are affected. You may also have issues with the mouth as it forms, mm -hmm. something you call a cleft palate. Mm -hmm. Blind defects. Mm -hmm. Blind defects. Mm -hmm. um, it may also cause some forms of problems with the brain, but the pathway is not chromosomal, but yes, it is associated with birth defect, mm -hmm. especially if your sugar levels are not well controlled before you fall pregnant. The baby forms in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. That is why when Dr. Nye was giving his talk, when he was talking about preconception care, he said if you have a condition that can affect pregnancy, one of them is diabetes, you need to have them optimized before you get pregnant. Because if you don't do that, commonly pregnancy, you know it backwards. When you miss your period, you then you know you've been pregnant. And by that time, you've had the baby in your group for about two to three weeks. So that exposure to very high sugar levels in those first eight weeks is what can be associated with these birth anomalies. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, it can cause anomalies, but not through chromosomal pathway. Mm -hmm. It's the high sugar levels that trigger it. Mm -hmm. Then maybe just to add uh, to what Dr. Modoni has said, those are mothers we, we, we prefer actually to increase the, the um, dose of folic acid. So normally we come down to about 400 to 800 micrograms, that's 0 0.4 or 0 0.8 mg. Uh, but for these mothers, we actually are still holding on to 5 mg. So, you know, that's at least even more than, it's about 10 times the dose of folic acid just to prevent uh, the um, congenital defects that are associated with uh, high sugars in the first trimester. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nyawera and Dr. Moloni. I have a uh... Uh, our audience who have had their hands up, I don't know if Espedita Nyaga, are you still on? I allow you to ask your question. Espedita, are you still there? When I still come in. Okay. When the... Yes, Dr. Tari. Yes, I was going to suggest, and I'm sure you have thought about it, that uh, there should be a feeding uh, platform for presentations, maybe in this forum, into the same uh, mom's club protocol, mm -hmm. so that uh, even after the presentation, 
when they go home, they can always revisit. Yeah. They can read it slowly. They can ask questions now based on reference points. So, so all the, the materials uh, provided in this presentation should be made available to all members of the MAMS Club. It is the one who added advantage that uh, you'll be having moments in your own quiet time at home when you're taking tea to read through or listen through so that at least you assimilate what we present in this forum. And even going forward, all the presentation that will be made, if the people already referred, it should be help you to, 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 to understand your pregnancy and to achieve objectives. Thank you, Dr. I don't know if Peter Mwangi, you are still on. I allow you to ask your question. Let's give you a chance. I don't know whether you're still around. Okay, uh, seems uh, they're not with us. Uh, because of time factor, I can see we are having quite a lot of questions. Uh, we have shared our, our Moms Club uh, WhatsApp line uh, on the chat and we'll continue sharing. We will be responding to all these questions. Dr. Ngayu will be responding to these questions on the chat. But just before we go off, I would like uh, Dr. Ngayu to respond to what causes cerebral palsy and is it preventable? The cerebral palsy is a preventable illness. And uh, the one we are very familiar with is the one that will occur as a complication during birthing process. Um, if you have a difficulty delivery, especially second stage of delivery, uh, and the baby uh, uh, takes in the amniotic fluid, which is uh, uh, got uh, paid with the baby's poo is likely to cause a cerebral palsy in that regard. We call it, uh, what do you call it? Meconium aspiration, yeah, but this gives uh, something. It's such a cerebral pass, yeah. Arising from that, yes, it can be prevented, but of course, with the proper management of that labor process. Uh, maybe I can add to that. To understand the condition better, cerebral palsy is a condition where the baby's brain is affected by low oxygen levels, um, which causes long-term effects on how the brain functions. So how it manifests is the child might have laid milestones, problem with speech, problem with learning, problems with mobility. And these conditions can occur when the woman is pregnant, when the woman is delivering and also after delivery. So while she's pregnant, there are conditions that can affect oxygen flow to the baby, low blood levels, the placenta detaches before time. If she has a critical illness that affects her oxygen levels, it can contribute. It can be contributed to by the events that occur during labor. That's why your labor has to be well managed. Like Dr. Harry said, if the baby is distressed, if the labor is prolonged, it needs to be picked up in good time and intervention put in place. It can also occur if the baby is critically ill after delivery, the first few days of life, especially the babies who end up going to the newborn intensive care unit or babies who will need high level of care. If they have gone through an event that can cause low blood oxygen levels to the brain, it can trigger cerebral palsy. Unfortunately, it's Such not... Infections. Yes, and even very severe infections, meningitis, severe pneumonia, septicemia, they all contribute to that. Mm -hmm. So those are the conditions that can result in cerebral palsy. Is it preventable? It depends on the cause. Mm -hmm. Some causes may be preventable, others may be not. But the ones which are preventable are the ones which you're able to pick up. Like Dr. Terry said, do your antenatal clinics, have a thorough screening, see if there are any conditions can affect the baby. Labor should be well managed, uh, hopefully not at home, but under the care of specialists. Also, if the baby is born and they are sick, they need care of neonatologists and pediatricians to take them through the critical time they are unwell so that they don't have long-term effects and if there are any problems, they are picked up in good time and interventions put in place. But that said, they say actually almost... To, as a half of the cerebral palsies may not be preventable, only a half can be prevented. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that's why uh, these questions, I really don't know which one to leave out and which one to ask. I feel like asking all of them, but if I do, we'll leave here at 2 p.m. Eh? So uh, we'll have it being responded to, but one more, um, this one has kept on coming up. Can you tell us more on chemical pregnancy? Chemical pregnancy, what causes it and if there is any remedies to avoid it? Can, can the speaker give more context to that question? That is what she has asked. I've been trying to understand it also. Um, I understand her question. Mm -hmm. it's okay. it's a pregnancy. Right no, no, no. It's a pregnancy where you test PDT positive. Ah, okay. And then okay. after a while, there's no baby that forms. Mm. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> What we call like an embryonic pregnancy. Yes. Oh, chemical pregnancy. Yeah, so often we term it as blighted over. Many people will hear blighted over, missed miscarriage, missed abortion. Um, it's, you know, the, the pregnancy happens in, it, it, it's a funny thing how the pregnancy, it's, it's the way the mechanism of pregnancy, how it works. The, the moment the sperm and the egg meet, Yes, two, the two genetic material is as come as one. So that's the baby. But that baby needs to be supported by several other things around. Um, and so those several other things around are actually processes that are happening independently of, of what is that, of the baby itself from So usually the hormone of pregnancy, uh, uh, um, is, is like, you know, the machinery around the pregnancy itself, the baby itself, the developing fetus that is already kick-started um, in parallel to, to you know, the, the process of genetic material coming together. So you may find, uh, a, uh, usually with those pregnancies, you find a sac, but then it's empty. So you know, you, you're finding like you have a house, but then it's empty. So that house, the sac, those are all things that are producing uh, chemicals of pregnancy without the inhabitant itself. And that's what a chemical pregnancy is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nyawera. Jemima, I have a comment for you here. Jemima, I hope I will be the first beneficiary of this club. I'm almost due. So Jemima, you have work to do. Another one has said, Jemima, I hope you're part of this club mm -hmm. and you are a beneficiary. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much. I would like to ask all these questions, but I have Dr. Nyawera and uh, Dr. Um, um, Modoni on the chat and they are responding to your questions of the, on the chat because of time factor. Please do not leave, uh, let them respond to your questions. Uh, one more, this is internal. I would like to raise it up for the benefit of the case managers. We are getting uh, cases uh, where children are diagnosed with sickle cell, that goes to Dr. Ngayu. Uh, sickle cell traits and uh, parents are not aware. Um, should sickle cell tests be done during antenatal or on all newborn babies. Dr. Ngayu, that is your question. The care managers of APA Insurance are asking, they're having a lot of babies born with sickle cell. So do you think that the test should be part of the antenatal profile? In fact, it's interesting. When we are preparing this presentation, we had actually put it there and uh, we deliberated it on it. Then I don't know what reasons we, we thought we should pull it out. Yeah, and I, I, and I think this is a very important area because recently, uh, director uh, of the health organization, Dr. Amoth, had uh, actually indicated that it will be taken up as a policy in the country to advise uh, to, to, to be couples or people engaging and wanting to get married and have babies to have a mandatory or an advice that they should go through screening for sickle cell traits. 
And the, the idea here is to avoid the aftermath of the process. For those who are aware of a sickle child, it's a very painful disease. It's a very painful process. The morbidity is so high, it's very expensive without any reasonable, achievable goals or management, it is a very difficult journey. And if we can avoid to avoid that suffering that parents have to go through with a secular child or a secular adult, uh, it, it is very good. So how do we do that? We get the to-be parents to be screened for whether they are sickle cell treat or whether they are sickle And if they were, uh then they can be helped should they proceed on with their marriage or should they seek other ways of having babies without necessarily having to, cons to consummate the marriage with a baby of their own when they know they are sickness out of those people who are sickle cell traits a quarter of their offsprings are most likely going to be sickness and this is what we are trying to avoid yes it is a thought and should be looked at it could be embodied into the antenatal of profile screening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nayu. Uh, up on the screen, uh, we can see the location where you can find Dr. Nyawera, Dr. Mondoni, and Dr. Nayu. Uh, they are located at 40 Suits uh, Hospital Road, 50th floor, room number 511. That is where we can find them. There will also be part and parcel of the MAMS Club. We'll have a day when Daktari will be on. The way we plan our MAMS Club is always we'll have a doctor on this side. Jemima mentioned about a Wednesday, and uh, that is when we'll be having doctors on. But I would like to hand this over to Jemima to give the closing remarks. We are humbled to have you back, Jemima, to you for the closing remarks. All right, thank you so much, Zainab. Uh, Dr. Nayu, Dr. Mudoni, and Dr. Nyawira. It was a beautiful webinar where we have the privilege of three doctors in the room. It's not a very common occurrence. So we really appreciate your time. We really take, we really appreciate that you had to spend to spare your time to come here at Apollo Suit so that we can be able to have a very successful webinar and a successful launch of the APA Maps Club. Um, to all that have logged in, I can see quite a significant number. We really want to appreciate you for taking your time to come and listen and get empowered. We, 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 our intention is that you get empowered and be able to walk this journey in a knowledgeable way and be able to utilize that knowledge to navigate the issues of life. So I want to also um, appreciate my hosts and my team here. We have Zainab who has been uh, moderating the session. We have behind the scenes, we have the, our IT, Eric, is here with us, and Lillian. We also have um, our, our, our medical team, Anne Mudoni, who was here sitting on the back end. And we have also our business development senior manager, Deborah Naliaka. So without any further ado, I would want to end the session and the answer to your questions are being typed. So in case of any other questions, please feel free to join the WhatsApp group of the MAMS Club. Ask your questions there. We will have them answered by the expert. Dr. San, I wish you a lovely Friday and a wonderful weekend ahead. God bless you.